Today, I ask Paula Fredrickson, who are the heroes in your academic pursuit of understanding the first century, Jesus studies, Paul studies, you name it, who are they? And how have they influenced you? Also, are there any academic studies or people who have written works that you totally disagree with, but have also helped you get closer to drawing the conclusions you do today? Thank you so much for those who made this possible, these 12 videos with Paula Fredrickson, and thank you for joining our Patreon to keep these kind of things coming. Dr. Fredrickson, I really appreciate you. Again, I can't tell you how this is amazing, being able to do this. Who were the most influential scholars, plural, I know we're going to talk about some singulars here, but it's <laughs> plural, in all your research as an academic, and in what ways did they truly change your understanding in your field of research? Wow. I read as much as I can. Um, and there are so many brilliant people who have worked in this field. But I'd, I'd have to say if I were reconstructing an academic genealogy for myself, I think the founding father would be Schweitzer. Because of his recreation of a robust Jewish apocalyptic eschatology as the matrix both for Jesus and for Paul, um, he's, he's where I start from. Uh, following him, the Scandinavian scholars, uh, Stendhal and Munch and um, Dahl, with, both with their, um, Stendhal particularly on Paul, Dahl on both, Paul and Jesus. Um, and Munch with, um, with Paul. Munch's first uh, chapter of his, um, his important book is called The Call, not The Conversion. And it's, once you bump into a good idea, it's so obvious you can't believe you didn't think of it yourself. Paul says he was called. He doesn't say he was changed. He didn't say he went over. He didn't say I converted. He says I was called. And that's prophetic language. It's, it doesn't put him outside of, of Jewishness at all. He's, in fact, entirely within it. Um, so those scholars, and uh, Christer, was, who's a theologian as well as an historian, um, acknowledged forthrightly that it's 2,000 years after the declaration of the coming kingdom, and no amount of, what did he call it, hermeneutical gymnastics can deny that simple fact. So he was able to look square in the face that the, those eschatological prophecies were part of the foundation of the movement and that they cannot be usable theologically for somebody in the 20th and 21st century. And I think that takes a tremendous amount of theological courage. And I also think it's historically true. So, and of course, Ed Sanders changed the game for everybody both with Jesus and especially with Paul and Palestinian Judaism, or he should have changed the game more than it ended up being changed, I think. But he's an absolutely foundational figure in late 20th century New Testament scholarship. And right now, um, I'm reading, uh, I think the, the way that uh, David Litwa uh, is so agile with uh, pagan materials and Hellenistic Jewish materials. It's, it's reconfiguring and reframing um, stuff. Robin's book, um, tremendous, imaginative, Candida Moss's work on martyrdom. I, I range up to late antiquity, so I'd have to say Peter Brown was, uh, he invented the field of late antiquity as, a, as an arena of scholarship. Um, but yeah, those are, those are my heroes. I really appreciate that. I was thinking about your particular take in this conversion language that you have done many lectures against, showing yeah. there's, a, there's a turning but not a conversion or a change but not like a complete I am changing to something else. And there are some who are naysayers to this kind of idea. And they'll say, oh, you're just trying to be politically correct um, because of post-Holocaust, you know, situations and things like that. I, I think the Holocaust is genuinely regrettable. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I just think yeah. that they're trying to say, oh, well, we're softening our tone about Paul for this reason. But that doesn't seem, in all that I've read of yours, 
ever even a motivating factor on Paul. I mean, it, would, it wouldn't hurt that if it, we found out Paul's extremely Jewish and in a Jewish background, that even is better. But th- that's not the motivation. He was flawless with respect to the law. And by being a Pharisee, he was one of the expert uh, interpreters of the law. He's, there's a lot of resistance to seeing Paul within Judaism as um, an operative school of interpretation. And um, people like N.T. Wright will make fun of it and say, oh, you're looking at the material through the tearful, tear-misted spectacles of post-Holocaust scholarship, as if that shouldn't be the case. But historically, Paul is called and he's still functioning with He's He's talking about a Messiah. He's talking about a resurrection of the dead. Who else is talking about that kind of stuff, right? And he's he's quoting Isaiah all over Romans mm-hmm. as his validating source, authoritative source for his message. He's he's enti- and he's expecting the end of time. You don't start a new religion if you're expecting the world to end in your own lifetime. So for all these reasons, I think that arguing that Paul remains within Judaism isn't even a historical question. It's just what the evidence says. In terms of conversion for his, there are two issues, the the so-called conversion of Paul, and then there's the, uh, is he converting Gentiles? He's specifically not converting Gentiles. That's why he's saying no circumcision. And if he's in a binary system of Jewishness and everything else, the only thing for people to convert to if they're not converting to Judaism is staying within paganism. He's not saying that. So what are they doing? He's looking at Isaiah. He's looking at the classical prophets. And that's when people turn to the God of Israel, but they do so as Gentiles. They don't do it. They don't become, there's no apocalyptic circumcision party, right? Mm -hmm. People are, the nations are saved as the nations and Israel is saved as Israel. So that's another reason why if, if Paul is insisting that Gentiles remain Gentiles, they can only be Gentiles if Israel exists. Right. You need you need both binaries to have that sociological category work. So if if and this is what Ephesians collapses. Right. Israel remains Israel. Gentiles remain Gentiles. They just don't worship idols anymore. But if Gentiles have to remain Gentiles and doesn't Israel have to remain Israel? Mm. I love your scholarship. And while you have your heroes, there are people who I'm certain see you as theirs. So I hope that we continue uh, educating people. And uh, I'm sure there are plenty of people you could list that their works impacted in some way. And even if you thought they were wrong, it was due to their work that helped you to maybe see a clearer picture. And that's some of the times that I see, even when I'm I'm not an academic, but like I'll listen and read all these scholars and I'll go, you know what, they did help me better grasp something, but I do think they took maybe wrong conclusions or whatever, but it helped me. And I think that's what we're supposed to do. Well, yeah, I'd have to say in that category, um, the so-called new perspective on Paul, which is attributed to Sanders, but Sanders himself does not subscribe to it as the, um, the 40th anniversary edition of Paul and Palestinian Judaism has a very important introduction by Mark Chancy, where he, he mentions that Sanders is not a new perspective on Paul guy, um, but it's, it's Jimmy Dunn and a very eminent scholar, N.T. Wright, very heavily published, Richard Hayes. And what they said was that after Paul and Palestinian Judaism, they couldn't say that Paul was writing against Jewish legalism, which is the whole Lutheran trope. Luther was criticizing Jewish legalism because he was going after Roman Catholicism in the Renaissance, and the the Jews were coding for the Catholics. Um, So the new perspective on Paul, people said, oh, it must be the ethnic specificity of Jewishness that Paul didn't like. Paul wasn't against Judaism. He was against circumcision, food laws, the Sabbath, uh, the temple cult. Uh, you know, and basically everything that makes up, he was against Jewish nationalism and Jewish ethnic pride. There, I mean, to, we are post Bismarck. We hear nationalism and we think nation states. I think um, uh, Tom Wright's Paul has a problem uh, with Theodore Herzl. Uh, he's, you know, it, there is no Jewish nationalism in the first century. And to say that Paul renounce, doesn't renounce Judaism, but all of the things that make up Jewishness doesn't get you very far. All it does is re-entrench 
the old perspective on Paul, that Paul somehow thought that there was something wrong with Jewishness and he had to fix it. And I found that very clarifying to think with, and I have read their, their works and it helped me a lot to think what I think. Thank you. Thank you to those who contributed in the GoFundMe on making this trip possible for these 12 recordings with Paula Fredrickson. I want to give a special shout out to you. Your names are chiseled in history. I also want to thank everybody who has become a patron of Myth Vision, making stuff like this possible, taking academic work that is hiding behind all of these scholarship, all of these colleges, and making it public, public knowledge for everybody to learn. Thank you.